I'm Constance McIntosh, I'm the director of the Health Law Institute. Uh, um, and I'm here at this moment to introduce Audrey Macklin. Um, Audrey holds a chair in human rights law at the University of Toronto. She formerly served on the Immigration and Refugee Board. And since taking her post at the University of Toronto Law School about 13 years ago, um, she has worked in human rights aspects of migration and administrative law. Um, Audrey was extensively involved in the Omar Khadr case and more recently was the academic lead uh, in challenging the lawfulness of federal decisions to attract health care um, from asylum seekers and refugees. I've had the pleasure of working with Audrey on this case. I'm going to step aside now. We have um, until close to about one, so we've got 45 minutes um, for Audrey to stand and deliver. Um, and then I'm hoping we'll have some time for some engaged and robust uh, questions. Thank you, and Audrey. Thank you, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. I love having any reason to come back to Halifax and to Dalhousie. And I'm happy to do it, uh, to talk about this particular issue, which I consider very important and, um, and in need of, of greater public awareness. I'm going to discuss changes to what is called the Interim Federal Health Program, which is a system of providing publicly insured health care to certain categories of refugees and people I will call asylum seekers. It is delivered federally, which of course distinguishes it from what you know about most health care in Canada, which is delivered provincially. So the story, if you will, of the Interim Federal Health Program arises at the intersection of two regimes, that of health care and immigration law. My area of specialty is much more in immigration law. I expect many of you have much greater expertise than I do in health law. But hopefully over the course of this discussion, there'll be exchanges, and I'm, I'm sure that I will learn from your comments and questions as well. But let me begin by telling you a few things about the refugee regime on the assumption that perhaps not all of you are familiar with it. Refugees are defined as people who are outside their country of nationality and are unable or unwilling to return to that country for reasons of a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, something called membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. The refugee definition in law is somewhat narrower, perhaps, than what you might otherwise assume to uh, be encompassed by the term refugees. There are two ways in which refugees can come to Canada. One is by being sponsored from abroad. That is to say, the government of Canada and private individuals can select refugees from abroad and bring them to Canada. Um, the government brings over uh, around 5,000 or so per year. That number has been declining uh, over the past few years. And in fact, there's something of a mismatch between what the government declares it will bring over in terms of numbers and the numbers they actually bring over. The number of privately sponsored refugees, similarly, um, there is a quota the government sets and there are many individuals who want to sponsor, but the numbers who are actually enabled to come over to Canada are also smaller than often projected, again, in the 5,000 range. So those are sponsored refugees, and they come over already having been recognized as refugees. The other and larger category are people I will call asylum seekers. Those are people who arrive at Canada's border and claim refugee status. They say, I am a refugee. Now, what is the legal regime that authorizes that? Well, in 1969, Canada signed the United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees. This convention was actually um, initially promulgated in 1954, but Canada didn't sign on until 1969. And what it does is commit Canada to not send back to their country of origin people who meet the definition of a refugee that international legal obligation has been incorporated into Canadian law. So the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act of Canada says, if you meet the international definition of a refugee, we will not send you back to your country of origin, except in certain limited circumstances. Um, so I emphasize this to say, those who come to Canada claiming asylum are claiming a right that we have created and enshrined in our law. Right? They're not coming here 
um, to do anything other than what Canada has promised it will do. But of course, Canada has a system in place for determining whether people do or do not, in fact, fall in the definition. Lots of people show up at the border, say, I'm a refugee. But of course, somebody has to decide, and it's in Canada, it's the Immigration and Refugee Board, whether the person actually meets the definition or not. Now, in 2012, the current government brought in significant reforms to the refugee system regarding asylum seekers. And these were publicized and promoted by the government as a response to a refugee determination system that it described as slow, expensive, and broken. Um, broken in the sense that it was uh, widely and systematically abused by people who knowingly and deliberately came to Canada saying they were refugees, but in fact were not. Now, the, this idea of casting suspicion and denigrating those who seek asylum in Canada is not new, nor is it unique to Canada. Virtually all industrialized states that have signed on to, that have um, ratified the convention relating to the status of refugees, simultaneously exert extraordinary effort to deflect, deter, and discredit asylum seekers, okay? to prevent them from getting to the countries that have signed on to the refugee convention and claiming the rights that these countries have voluntarily uh, assumed as obligations. So countries do it in two ways. They do it discursively, right? By talking about the people who come to seek refugee protection as if they are, and I'm hoping you recognize these words, frauds, bogus, right? Cheats, scammers, <coughs> economic migrants, okay? Smuggled, terrorists, security threats, okay? In ways that are, make us, prime us for believing that the people who come are not genuine, even before any process has happened to actually determine the authenticity of any individual claim. Okay? So we make them disappear in our discourse. The people who come saying they're refugees, well, they're really not refugees, and we know that. Having laid the groundwork for that, then the government can, in fact, go ahead and promulgate policies that actually make them disappear by making it impossible to come to Canada legally to claim refugee status, okay? by enacting processes that make it very difficult for one to fairly present one's refugee claim, um, and by limiting the recourse that people have uh, for challenging uh, a decision that is negative, and so on and so forth. I give all of this to you as background in order that you might better understand how to situate the changes to the interim federal health program. So, let me start by describing the Interim Federal Health Program. I'm not expecting you to read this. <laughs> there was an order in council in 1957, over 50 years ago, before Canada signed on to the Refugee Convention, and before the rise of publicly funded provincial health care. There was an order in council arising out of the post-World War II migrations to Canada that said when immigrants arrive in Canada, and before they get settled, if you will, the federal government will, as a gesture of generosity, cover their short-term emergency, urgent, essential health care costs. Okay? And this was the order in council. This is as long as it was, barely a page, right? certainly no details. This order in council is the basis of the interim federal health program as it existed until 2012. It's not, a, it's not legislation. It's not even a regulation. It is some uh, kind of an undertaking by the cabinet. Now, in the ensuing 50 years between, the past, between this order and council creating the interim federal health program and the time of its change in uh, 2012, there were two major developments. One, of course, was the introduction of publicly insured health care delivered by provinces and framed, if you will, by the Canada Health Act principles of universality, portability, etc. So, at the time the order and council was made, there was no in the sense, systematic, nationwide, publicly insured provincial <laughs> health care. But over the 50 years, this grew up around the order in council. So that the, order, so that the idea of providing government-funded health care to a group of individuals was no longer simply an exception, but rather just a different way of delivering what had become the norm. Secondly, as I mentioned, in 1969, Canada um, ratified the Refugee Convention and then incorporated it into Canadian law and we saw a very large increase in the number of refugee claimants coming to Canada, of course, and the development of a whole bureaucratic administrative regime around refugee determination. 
Okay? And so over time, the interim federal health program under this order and council, which had been a program devised for just incoming immigrants, if you will, became largely dedicated to providing health care for people who came to Canada either as government-sponsored refugees or as asylum seekers from the time that they entered Canada until such time as they were either eligible for provincial health care because they, and they were remaining in Canada permanently, or they left the country. Okay? And there was an elaborate system of health insurance. It provided basically to refugees who are not yet eligible for, for provincial health care and asylum seekers who are at some point in the system, health care that was more or less equivalent to the health care <laughs> provided to low income or people on social assistance by the provinces. So in other words, what somebody would get under the IFHP, who is you know, eligible, would be what you get under Nova Scotia health care, the basic health care, plus some supplemental benefits that are typically available to people on social assistance or low income people or sometimes um, elderly people. And those are roughly speaking certain prescription drugs, certain emergency dental and vision care, and some assistive devices. So there was basic health care plus this supplement. Okay. So that's the key point I, I want you to take away from this, is that by 2012, the IFHP provided to all beneficiaries basic health care plus a basket of supplements roughly equivalent to that which a person on social assistance who is a Canadian uh, resident of a province would get. Okay, so then what happened in 2012? What we have are changes to this system that take the pool of people who used to get this health care, government-sponsored, privately-sponsored refugees, and asylum seekers, who all used to get the same basket that I just described. Now they were being allocated into separate classes, and different levels of health care were being uh, delivered, if you will, depending on which class you fell into. So starting at the top, you have government-sponsored and some of the privately-sponsored refugees they remained in receipt of the status quo ante. That is what they got before under the IFHP, basic and some supplemental. Then you had ordinary refugee claimants, by which I mean ordinary asylum seekers, people who show up at the border and claim refugee status. They got a smaller basket labeled urgent and essential health care, okay? kind of a basic minimum. Okay. Then there were refugee claimants who were called Designated Country of Origin, DCO refugee claimants. Okay. These were people who came from countries that the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration decided were safe countries, by which the minister meant these people are coming from countries that are safe, so they must be not genuine refugees. These are probably people who are bogus, they are cheats, they are liars, they are Roma, and they are Mexican predominantly. The government named a bunch of other countries, but basically the real targets here were Hungary and Mexico. Okay. And so people from those countries and a list of other EU countries were considered to be coming from safe countries. The minister considered people who came from those countries to not be in need of refugee protection, at least presumptively. They still got to go through the refugee determination process, but through an expedited shorter process with fewer recourses in case, that, in case they were refused. Okay. So in anticipation that these people were going to be refused because they were not genuine, they were denied all health care. Okay. So if you're from a safe country, a designated safe country, you get nothing except what is called public health and public safety. Okay. The same applies to people whose refugee claims are heard and refused. They also get nothing except public health and public safety. So I'll tell you what that is. Public health and public safety health coverage is not health coverage that is first and foremost designed to resolve, address a health problem of the individual. This is coverage that is designed to protect other people from the contagious or dangerous sickness that that person has. So that might be, in the case of public health, tuberculosis, HIV, uh, meningitis. Public safety, uh, that would typically be some kind of psychotic condition that might provoke violent conduct. So the idea is that people in these categories from safe countries 
or who are refused, they don't get health care. We get health care delivered via them. Okay? We are protected from the danger they pose to us. Okay. Okay, then there are other people, people who have abandoned or withdrawn their refugee claim, so they started the process and then they pulled out of it, or they missed a deadline and are deemed to have abandoned their refugee claim. Okay, and just know that, again, under the current law, uh, the deadlines are very tight and difficult to meet. But if they have been deemed abandoned because they didn't show up for a hearing deliberately or inadvertently, or if they've actually affirmatively withdrawn their claim, said, I don't want to make a refugee claim anymore, or people who are ineligible, I won't tell you much about those, okay, or people who, have, who entered Canada or remained in Canada surreptitiously, that is, people who are often regarded as so-called illegals, and I'll refer to as people without status, those people get no health care at all. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay? Um, and so that's the status quo ante. They were never covered under the interim federal health program, and they continue not to be covered under the interim federal health program. Okay? So they don't even get public health and public safety coverage. Okay, so what I, what I have here on the far right is a way of understanding how you might under, distinguish between these classes. Right? You can't distinguish between these people on the basis of their need for health care, right? You can't read off of how somebody entered Canada or what country they're from, whether they do or will or will not need any health care. So how can you understand these differential classes? Well, I would suggest to you that one way of understanding them is in relation to the role of the government in choosing them. Government-sponsored and privately sponsored, to a lesser extent, refugees are people the government gets to go out and choose. Okay. Refugee claimants are people the government didn't get to choose. People who are rejected or refused refugee claimants are those who have arrived unbidden, unwanted, and have been uh, you know, determined not to fit the refugee definition. And so you can, and of course, then there are people who have withdrawn from the progr program, and they have, in a sense, selected themselves out. So one way of understanding this hierarchy, if you will, is along the line of the role of the state in being able to pick who comes in and who doesn't. Okay? And I mention that to you because that's an important... Um, metric of immigration law. Okay? The idea of sovereign states being able to choose who comes in is very important to people's idea of what it means to be a sovereign nation. And the refugee regime, in some sense, represents an incursion into that sovereignty because it says if you show up at the border, even though we didn't pick you, if you happen to meet the refugee definition, we have bound ourselves not to exercise our sovereign right to exclude you. And as I mentioned right at the outset, this is something that states have grown to really dislike about the refugee regime. They really deeply resent that their ability to decide who gets in and who doesn't has been constrained. Okay, and I'm going to come back to this, this kind of what I describe as a kind of moral hierarchy uh, in a moment. Okay. Now, how does this all play out? That's really, you know, what's okay, most useful here. So let me just give you, rather than try to drill down into these definitions, I want to just give you illustrations of what this means operationally, this classification system that I've described. Okay. So imagine then you've got a Congolese refugee claimant who has a heart attack. Okay. That person is a refugee claimant in the second category. That refugee claimant will get medical treatment if uh, he has a heart attack. If the person who has a heart attack is Roma from Hungary, no medical care. Okay. No insured medical care. Let's say you are a diabetic and you're Syrian and you've been brought over by the government as a refugee. You will get coverage for your insulin. If you've shown up at the border as a Syrian who's diabetic, you will get no insulin. Say you're a pregnant North Korean woman with something called preeclampsia, which is a fairly serious pregnancy condition. Right, that has to be closely monitored and treated. Okay? If you show up at the border and you are a pregnant North Korean refugee claimant with preeclampsia, you will get prenatal care. If, as that period of your pregnancy is passing, your refugee claim is heard and refused, you'll be cut off health care. You'll get no prenatal care, you'll get no care during the delivery. Okay. If you're a Mexican refugee claimant with tuberculosis, you'll get diagnosis and treatment. If you're a Mexican refugee claimant with a detached retina, you won't. If you are a refused refugee claimant who is psychotic and dangerous, you will get treatment and medication. If you are a refused refugee claimant who is merely suicidal, you won't. 
if you are a government-sponsored Tibetan refugee and you're a child and you've got asthma, you'll get anti-asthma medication. If you're an Afghan child who's a refugee claimant who showed up at the border with her parents and you're asthmatic, you will get no anti-asthma medication. But if you have an asthma attack and you go to the hospital, you will get treated. But you won't get the medication when you leave. Okay. And of course, if you're a Hungarian child who happens to have asthma, you'll get nothing at all. So that's how this interim federal health program sorts, classifies, categorizes for purposes of allocating health care. So what I'd like to do now is turn to what the government objectives are behind this. That is, the government objectives that they state are advanced by this policy. And this emerges from affidavit evidence that we have been in receipt of uh, in the course of litigating a, a charter challenge to the Interim Federal Health Program. So the government produced three affiants, three government uh, officials who work in the Department of Citizenship and Immigration Canada to explain uh, what the purposes of this policy were. Interestingly, um, they did not produce as an affiant the director of the medical section of CIC, who happens to be a physician. All of their affiants are non-physicians. And one of, one of the things we wonder about is why she was not brought forward as an affiant. Okay? Uh, because she is somebody who could be asked and presumably could respond to questions about the medical uh, consequences and significance of these changes. Okay, so one view, one reason for... Uh, Revoking the 1957 order in council and producing a new one was simply to modernize a system, modernize and uh, rationalize and have a policy that actually explained what was going on. And that seems to make some sense because as I showed you, the 1957 order in council, wildly outdated, completely vague and uh, you know, had no detail whatsoever. So that seems to make some sense. Another reason for changing the policy as it was from what I have just shown you it has become was to advance the idea of fairness to Canadians. So this new policy is fair to Canadians. So right away, you are primed to think, huh, so there is a problem here of unfairness to Canadians. That was a problem that this policy is solving. So there was something about the way in which refugees and refugee claimants were being treated that was unfair to Canadians. And this policy is correcting that. So what were some of the problems that this policy is solving. A problem of formal equality. I don't know if you heard um, in defense of the interim federal health program the claim that refugees, refugee claimants were receiving so-called gold-plated health care. And a claim that what they were getting was better than what Canadians got. And how unfair is that? Right? And you might say that would be unfair. You can imagine that on a basic formal equality one population is getting more better health care coverage than another. Well that claim turns in part on uh, who you're comparing the population to. So in the, in the case of the IFHP, as I told you, the people were in receipt of health care coverage approximately the same as what somebody on social assistance would get in the provinces. Okay. But since people in that situation get some supplemental coverage that other people don't, then that was thought to be, you know, then the government is using as a comparator people who are not on social assistance. So if IFHP recipients get prescription coverage and people who are not on social assistance in the provinces don't get prescription coverage, that's unfair. Okay. So you, right away you might want to think about what the appropriate comparison is, or comparator group. But the other point is, just to go back to where we were before, recall that I said even if you wanted to attain so-called formal equality, all that would lead you to is removing the supplemental benefits. But as I pointed out to you, you have at least two categories, three categories, who receive nothing whatsoever. So even if your goal was so-called formal equality, the IFHP goes far beyond that by stripping health care to nothing or virtually nothing for a large swath of the affected people. Okay. Um, excuse me while I flip pages here. Um, I want to move on to this idea of moral desert as another justification, fairness to Canadians. The way that this is pitched is that health care, of course, can be allocated according to a number of different metrics. You can allocate health care according to the market, right? Up until Obamacare, I suppose, comes in. That's how notionally it's done in the United States. Your ability to access health care is directly related to your ability to pay. 
or to pay for insurance. You could allocate health care access, public health care access, according to residence, right? Depends where you live and how long you've lived there, okay? Or you can accord health care, of course, according to moral desert. Some people deserve health care more than others. And we will allocate health care according to how much people deserve to have their health problems dealt with. So you calibrate entitlement to health care according to whether one is deserving of refugee protection or not. That's what the IFHP does, right? The government-assisted refugees, well, they're the most deserving because the government has picked them. Okay? Refugee claimants, less deserving, because we're not really sure about them. They're showing up at the border uninvited. Okay? We're not sure that they're deserving, so we're going to give them less than those we got to choose. We're going to give even less to those who come from countries where we are presuming that refugee claimants are bogus and frauds. Okay? And we are going to give least of all you know, to those who have been refused, because we now know they are bogus and fraud, and they certainly don't deserve anything. They shouldn't be here. Therefore, they don't deserve health care. So one way of understanding, then, the system is to understand it being calibrated according to a notion of moral desert that is derived from one's immigration status. Okay? One's entitlement to be in Canada, then, is transposed into the availability and quantum of health care that one is entitled to. Okay. So that's another kind of um, way in which fairness to Canadians is advanced. It is fair to Canadians to withhold health care from those who don't deserve it. Okay. Another objective of the system is to protect public health and safety. So I suppose that explains why even those who are undeserving of health care, those who are from safe countries, designated safe countries, and those who are um, refused nevertheless get public health and safety coverage because we need to be protected from them in case they have a contagious disease or um, they are otherwise dangerous to us. So I guess that explains why we have public health and safety coverage for refused refugee claimants and claimants from so-called safe countries. It doesn't actually explain why we don't even give that to the last category of people, right? The people who are abandoned, withdrawn, or without status, right? Presumably, we want to be protected from them if they're contagious as well, but we don't. Or we aren't. And finally, most clearly, the goal is to deter abuse of the refugee system. Now, uh, well, actually, this isn't the final one, the fourth. So how is it uh, that the refugee system is being abused, and how will uh, withholding, ref withholding health care uh, help resolve that problem? Well, if you believe that refugee claimants are coming to Canada in order to access health care, that is, they aren't really refugees, but they wake up and decide that they want to go to Canada because they can get better health care coverage there, then you might be concerned that there is abuse of our health care system and therefore uh, withdraw access to health care in order to deter that. Just so happens there's no, no actual evidence of that, but that might be an argument. Right? Alternatively, and more broadly, if you have come to the view that people who seek Canada's protection are mainly, largely, mostly people who are not genuine, who are so-called economic migrants and are just coming here to abuse the refugee system in order to enter Canada for other purposes, okay, then you might want to deter them by making conditions here as unpleasant as possible to discourage them from coming or to discourage those who are, to discourage those who are here by making their lives miserable, as it were, and sending a message to others not to come because if you come, your life will be miserable too. Okay, so you might have this deterrence strategy. And here is where you know, it's important to think about the discursive work of making refugees disappear. The more you are persuaded that that's really what's going on, then the less troubled you may be by stripping away health care from people, by, you know, by the idea that, well, if a Hungarian boy or girl gets hit by a car, we might otherwise think that that's something we should be concerned about and, and you know, provide health care coverage. But if you know that that kid's a fraud, then maybe you'll be less concerned about denying health care to that person. Okay. And finally, there is cost containment, right? which is always, I think, a very live issue in any kind of health care allocation decision. So just uh, to give you a sense of that, and of course the government talks about how much money it will save in uh, cutting 
health care coverage to people under the IFHP. So in 2011-12, the IFHP cost, 83, cost the federal government $83 million. That amounts to about 0 .04, that is four one-hundredths of one percent of total health care expenditures across Canada. And in addition, of course, um, there aren't very many health care expenditures made by the federal government. They're mostly made by the provincial government in any event. Okay. So uh, from 2009, you might say, well, how much, you know, what does this shake down? We say $83 million, but what does that actually work out to? Well, per person. So in 2009, which is the last date I had, year I have figures for, the annual per capita cost, that is the amount of money spent on each person eligible under the IFHP per year was $552. Okay. The average per capita cost of health care for Canadians in 2009 was $5,401. In other words, about a tenth per capita. So refugee claimants cost about one tenth per capita of health care for Canadians. Now there are lots of variables to take into account about that, but suffice to say one thing. If you thought that refugee claimants were coming to Canada to exploit the healthcare system, you might have thought they'd make better use of it. Now, the annual cost of health care per taxpayer is something worth thinking about because, of course, this is often cast in the language of taxpayers absorbing, you know, paying for these refugee claimants. We, the taxpayer, are paying for their health care. Okay. So just to know what this $552 per year means to the taxpayer, the annual cost per taxpayer is 60 cents. Um, now, one of the other factors about cost containment to consider is whether, when the federal government stops paying the cost of health care services, what happens to people who are sick? Well, lots of sick people, of course, will not get any health care, right? That's obvious. But something else that happens is that some people who might otherwise go to get basic um, routine health care that can you know, resolve problems at an early stage, will just get sicker and sicker. And some of those people will get so sick that one way or another they end up in emergency wards. Okay. Well, the cost of emergency care is a whole order of magnitude greater than the cost of preventive care. For those people who end up in emergency wards, it's, the consequences can be variable. But in some provinces, and Nova Scotia may be one of them, hospitals either are obliged by law or by a kind of ethical commitment not to turn away people who show up in emergency wards. So some people may still get treatment if they show up in emergency wards. They will be billed for it, and they won't be able to pay. Okay? And what happens then? Well, it becomes part of the bad debt of hospitals. What happens to that bad debt? Typically, it is transferred or it is, it is ultimately eaten by the province. Right? So, if the federal government does not provide any health care coverage, there will be an increase in the use of emergency health care services. Okay? Those health care costs will end up being absorbed ultimately by the province. So, what does that mean? When the government, federal government says we're going to save $83 million per year on this, what it has not included in its calculation, of course, is the extent to which that cost will be transferred to the provinces. And then, and apparently, you know, the people who pay those costs are also taxpayers, right? So it's not at all obvious that the cost savings projected by the government, federal government, would be realized in any event. Okay, so these changes that I described to you were rolled out suddenly without notice or consultation, and they led to significant concern and protest uh, by a number of constituencies, including uh, the health providers. And I have to say uh, that the physicians uh, were extraordinary in stepping up and becoming, and, and really being in your face in their objections to this. Okay? Um, it had great consequences for them in their ability to do their job. They became, in effect, immigration, you know, extensions of the immigration bureaucracy. And the consequences for people, for physicians, were that not only were they you know, being told that they could not provide services to people in need, but they could not understand what the heck was going on because these things were rolled out fast. 
They were rolled out in a confusing way with no consultation, with no preparation. There are a lot of inconsistencies. Even Medavi, the health insurer who is managing this, didn't understand it. Systems were crashing. Rules were changing. <laughs> Just to give you one random example. So contagious diseases, public health, public safety. Tuberculosis. Yeah, you can, a doctor could get um, payment for running a test to see if somebody had TB, but they wouldn't get any payment for running a test to see what else the person might have or if the person had something else. So you could do the thing to demonstrate if the person had TB, but not if they had pneumonia, right? Because pneumonia is not covered as a public health disease. Or HIV. HIV was designated as a public health risk. So an individual could get coverage for antiretrovirals, but not antibiotics that were caused because of the secondary infections that people with HIV often get. Okay. So just a couple of examples. But what it also meant was that the confusion generated, the inevitable and predictable confusion generated by this had a chilling effect on many health providers who just said, you know what, I'm, I'm getting out of this. I am not going to provide any services to people in IFHP anymore because I can't figure it out. I don't know if I'm going to get paid. And furthermore, I don't know what the system actually requires of me. This was particularly acute, I think, uh, with respect to pregnancy. Because what it meant is that typically a physician takes on someone who, a woman who's pregnant at an early stage and sees her through to delivery. If the physician doesn't know if at some point during this, this person is going to transition to some new class and be denied health care, what is this going to mean for the physician's ability to do her or his job? So this had a chilling effect, even beyond what the law actually prescribed, because of the confusion generated. So people who might have been eligible for IFHP were being turned away by doctors who were confused and uncertain. Okay. So I just want to show you this because I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'll just give you a, an illustration of how, how impressive the announcement has the were. potential to help medical facilities like Toronto General, patients across Canada, and the field of medical imaging worldwide. Minister <clears throat> doctors in this country will not remain silent in the face of the concerns. Well, I'll, I'll answer those, those questions after my announcement. To the refugee health program. I will be very happy to answer those questions after. Of the most vulnerable members of our society, refugees who are coming from war-torn countries, fleeing hatred, fleeing crimes against humanity, and your government is about to cut the very essential medicines, the very essential services that these people require in order to continue living. This is not the legacy of Canada. This is not the kind of country that we want to live in. I am not alone. We have medical associations across this country, the CMA, the OMA. All of these organizations are denouncing your government's cuts to the interim federal health program. Perhaps, what, do you have, what do you have to say for yourself? Perhaps we could give the, the minister the privacy of finishing his remarks, and I'm sure... The minister will be questions. disrupted from this point on. Members of the Conservative government will be disrupted from this point on by Canadian doctors across this country. Across this country. Do you want an answer to your question? Please, please do. Okay. The answer to the question is that our government believes, as most Canadians believe, uh, that all Canadians should be given the same health care. Uh, uh, and we do not believe uh, that people who just arrived, uh, recent uh, refugees, should be given superior health care to that of Canadian residents and Canadian citizens. We are equalizing the health care so that everyone in this country is treated equally. Minister, you... Okay. I hope I persuaded you by now that that's false. Okay. But it was reiterated as recently as yesterday by the current immigration minister, uh, Chris, um, Chris Alexander. Okay. But, you know, the doctors were absolutely courageous in defense indefatigable, yeah, tireless <laughs> in their protests and kept it up and have been keeping it up. And that's, I think, really impressive, uh, for which they deserve great kudos. But here's the thing. I think there's no, probably no constituency in Canada that has greater social and moral capital than physicians. And the government was completely and resolutely, in, absolutely intransigent. The government has not budged on it. And if, the, you know, if a bunch of physicians out there protesting can't do anything, I think it demonstrates just how committed the government is to the current policy. Indeed, uh, this was one of the responses to it. Jason Kenney, then um, immigration minister, um, posted a petition uh, on his own website thanking himself uh, for his efforts. <laughs> yes. 
uh, to streamline benefits afforded to refugee claimants under the IFHP and bring them in line with the benefits received by taxpaying Canadians, including new Canadians. You'll notice as well here the taxpayer versus non-taxpayer. Just want to mention something to you in passing. Although many refugee claimants are in receipt of social assistance for reasons that should be obvious, okay, a lot of them are out there working too. They also are paying taxes, so, and it will be erroneous to assume that the population of refugee claimants uh, are not, does not include people who are working, and in any event, uh, paying taxes, as we all do every time we buy something. Okay, so this all led then to uh, litigation, uh, which I have been a uh, part of, and Constance McIntosh has been a part of, as have countless volunteers all doing this on a pro bono basis. Um, there have been over, we have, through our work, uh, gathered over 30 affidavits and over 1,000 pages of affidavit evidence in a relatively short time, and we are now before the federal court. We have completed two days of hearing, and we have one more day of hearing to go. And the litigants in this case include two individuals, Daniel Rodriguez and Hanif Ayubi. Daniel Rodriguez is from Colombia. He came to Canada. He made a refugee claim. His refugee claim was rejected. His wife's refugee claim was accepted. What that actually means is that she is now in a position to sponsor him as, her, as a spouse. But in the meantime, Daniel himself is subject to, he's a refused refugee claimant and subject to removal. He, he has not had the opportunity to go through the sponsorship process yet. During that time, when he was waiting, um, he experienced a detached retina. He was at risk of going blind. Um, he was cut off IFHP. Um, he asked for discretion to be exercised in his favor to cover him. He was rejected. He was told he was illegal. He should get out of the country. A doctor provided uh, free, uh, at, well, provided the surgery at a low cost, and other costs were waived, and ultimately his eye was saved. But he would have otherwise gone blind in that eye. Okay. Hanif Ayubi, an <laughs> Afghan refugee claimant who came to Canada, his refugee claim was denied. Uh, he is diabetic, and as a refused refugee claimant, he has cut off meds. Um, he has cut off all treatment, in fact, and he relies on um, donations of insulin from a clinic to keep him going. Um, he cannot leave Canada because Afghanistan is what's called a moratorium country. It is so dangerous that people aren't being returned there even if their claims have been refused. So he's a refused refugee claimant. He does not receive any health care, but he also can't leave Canada. Okay. All right. The public interest litigants, Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, which I'm a part of, uh, and Justice for Children and Youth okay, are the public interest litigants. We have been seeking public interest standing. Without going into detail, it would perhaps be surprising, but not sort of not surprising if you thought about it for a while. It's very difficult to, to find people to come forward as refugee claimants uh, to litigate this. So you might think, well, gosh, thousands and thousands of people have been cut off health care. Can't be that hard to find a few people to step forward. Well, it is. It actually turned out to be extraordinarily difficult, and for reasons that have to do with fear. Okay? People are legitimately fearful that if they come forward, they're going to be targeted for immediate deportation. And, there's, and who are we to say that that fear is not valid? So um, anyway, the case has been uh, heard. Um, OK. Now, it is argued under principles of public law and the charter. And I'll just mention a couple of things here about the charter aspects of the case. One of the charter arguments is under Section 7, the idea that the IFHP changes deprive individuals of their right to life and security of the person in a manner not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole argument. What I'd like to do is point out what I think is the weak spot of the argument from the perspective of those of us who are litigating it and just to put on the table what some of the challenges that come from uh, trying to argue this case. There is, I think you might be aware, a, a um, jurisprudence out there that shows the courts are resistant to recognizing positive rights or positive obligations on the state to do things as part of Section 7. And in particular, the idea that um, there is ambiguity, uncertainty, contestation around whether one can say one has a charter right to health care, whether the state has a positive obligation to provide health care. Um, our way of dealing with this for purposes of this case is to say we're not saying, we don't have to argue that there's a positive right to health care. 
What we are arguing is the government was doing this, and then it withdrew it. And in the retraction of it, in the deprivation of it then, it violated the rights to uh, life and security of the person. And there certainly is a long line of jurisprudence that when the state actively takes something away, that can constitute a charter breach. Okay? It is certainly arguable that there is and ought to be a, public positive, a positive right to public health care. It's just that, frankly, it's a tougher argument to make, and we don't feel like we have to push that argument first and foremost. It is complicated, of course, by the fact that there are categories of non-citizens who don't have access to public health care and never have. Okay? People who are so-called non-status people, so-called illegals. They've never had access to the IFHP, nor have tourists, for example, people who are in Canada temporarily and in sort of transiently. As an aside, let me just explain, uh, come back to non-status. But with respect to tourists, it's important to recall that refugee claimants aren't like tourists. Tourists make a decision to come to Canada to visit. They do it on their own schedule. And presumably, they can and do make provision to, for their own health care <coughs> needs before they come. They can have insurance from their home country. They can purchase insurance and so on. They're not in the same position as refugee claimants who, in some sense, are compelled to flee and don't have the luxury or perhaps the means of organizing their own health insurance before they come. The other argument under the Charter is Section 15, um, equality under the law. And so the idea here, of course, is twofold, that this deprivation of health care discriminates against refugees and asylum seekers. Okay? So as compared to other residents in Canada, Canadians and permanent residents and so on. It discriminates against a historically disadvantaged group. The other Section 15 argument is that within this hierarchy that the IFHP establishes, there is discrimination as between different types of refugees and refugee claimants. Now, um, I think, again, there's lots to be said about this, but from what I could say, the Justice, you know, Justice McTavish's questions were in the course of the hearing. What she kept coming back to was, well, she could sort of wrap her mind around why you know, government-sponsored refugees, privately-sponsored refugees, refugee claimants, even claimants from designated countries of origin were all entitled to health care. After all, they were either found to be refugees or had not yet been determined. You know, they were in that interim period. But people have been refused. Well, they aren't supposed to be in Canada at all. So it can't be discriminatory to deny them public benefits. And I think that's probably the tough, that seems to be a, a stickler, a, a difficult point for her. And I would say that um, the position that we are taking on that point is, excuse me a moment, while I find it, right, that refused refugee claimants should not be understood as one is as there's a temptation to do, as so-called illegals, as people who are here in Canada without any kind of legal authorization. In fact, they are. They have been a part of a process. That process ends when they depart from Canada. They may, or when they are given permanent resident status. Many people who are rejected as refugee claimants have other recourses that they are exercising, indeed, all the way up to the end. It's also the case that many people actually don't have the means to leave, and they may be subject to deportation, but until they've been deported, you know, they're not here illegally. They're not hiding out. They're not doing anything that is, in fact, in breach of Canada's immigration law. Okay. The other point I think that we will be making is, or that we have made, is it may be the case that refugee claimants who have been refused you know, ought to be leaving Canada. Okay. Um, and it may be that you can, you know, there are things that one can say about the inequality of people who are not citizens. They're not entitled to remain. Okay? But does it mean that just because you are unequal in your entitlement to remain in Canada, because you're not a citizen and you don't fall into any of the categories that allow you to remain, you can thereby de be denied essential services? So, for example, if I'm a refused refugee claimant, can the government say, we're not going to provide you with police services? So, if somebody assaults you and you call the police, too bad. You're not entitled to police protection because you are a failed refugee claimant and you shouldn't be here at all. Would we think that that was problematic? Okay. After all, police, you know, police protection, police services are also a public good. Okay. Would we say that just because you have no entitlement to remain in Canada, therefore, we can treat you any way we want with respect to the full range of public services? And we'd say, I don't think so. Okay. 
Um, or flip around another example. Let's say we decide you believe that people who are refused refugee claimants don't deserve to be here. They don't deserve any of the benefits that come from being here, like health care. Okay? They have done something wrong. Okay? They are, I don't know, they are, um, if you will, uh, bad people or wrongdoers. Well, there are all sorts of wrongdoers in our society. There are people we put in jail for committing wrongdoing. Okay? What if we decided to allocate health care in accordance with what kind of crime you have committed? After all, you know, if you are a wrongdoer in the criminal law, what if we say people in minimum security get better health care than people in maximum security? And by the way, this will serve as an effective deterrent. Okay? If you don't want to be denied health care services, then maybe you shouldn't go around committing crimes. Now, do we actually think that inequality in one domain, inmates are deprived of their liter liberty, they're unequal in that respect, justifies and allows inequal, unequal treatment in all domains? Okay. So, um, the last thing I think I'll just mention about this, in terms of explaining the inequality, steps outside of a technical Section 15 argument. Let me just say this. One of the curious things I noticed about this litigation is that in all of the evidence presented by the government, and there hasn't been much actually, um, what the government did not present is any evidence of any impact analysis it did. What would the impact of denying health care coverage to this population of people be? Now, I assume that when people make health care decisions, they do impact analyses on things like is it morbidity and mortality, right? To see what, what happens to people when you change access to health care. Okay? Nothing was done here, not done for refugee claimants as a population, or even done for children, right? Nothing at all. So in the government's arguments, there is no claim that there is a cost-benefit analysis of how much will be, you know, what is the cost to people's health if you do this to them. It is as if there is no cost because these people don't matter. So it's not just that they don't matter very much. They don't matter at all because if they mattered at all, you would want to say what's the impact on them going to be. But there has been in the government's evidence absolutely nothing about that. So when you think about what it means to be unequal, I suggest that what it means to be unequal is to be somebody who doesn't matter at all, to have no moral status, that your pain and your suffering simply doesn't count. It doesn't even enter into the calculus. It isn't even the subject of a cost-benefit analysis. And that to me is perhaps the most striking evidence of what I would call the kind of moral inequality of those subject to the interim federal health program changes. They count so little that they don't even count at all. Um, let me just close by saying, I have a couple of quotes from a decision by the German Constitutional Court, which I'm not gonna ask you to read, but I'll tell you that the way it approaches it is the idea that everybody is entitled to, under the law, to basic human dignity. And that, in turn, entitles everyone to a dignified minimum existence. And that dignified minimum existence does not depend on one's immigration status. If you are going to allocate health care or any kind of benefit according to one's immigration status, then you have to show that one's immigration status or one's residence in the country is related to one's need. So I'm not suggesting, and I don't think anybody who's argued this case has suggested that um, there's no differentiation possible between citizens and non-citizens. And frankly, if all the IFHP had done was take away the supplemental health benefits, you know, the prescription drugs and the assistive devices, I don't think we'd be in court. Okay? It's much more dramatic than that, and the significance, I think, goes much deeper than that. And I've already spoken longer than I meant to, so perhaps I'll just stop now and ask. Thank you and ask if you have any questions. Listening to you today, it makes 
puts me in mind of the current struggle for proposed Bill 2014, the doctrine of responsible act. And I regret to say I, I see so many parallels. Right? The government there and here is determined to ignore expert opinion and evidence. Um, the government has adopted a, a judgmental and a punitive uh, standard concerning a group where we have previously said they are especially vulnerable and deserve moral and legal protection. Um, the government uh, has constructed victims that require vengeance. Here is the Canadian taxpayer, and there is the victims uh, of persons who committed offenses while uh, mentally disordered. Uh, and the government doesn't even try to achieve any consistency between its proclaimed legislative objectives and you know, what the legislation is actually going to do. Uh, in my experience with the Bill C-14 struggle is that they are resolutely determined not to listen to anything. So, I mean, I don't want to be de too depressing for you. Maybe, you know, the court action here will produce something just as it might in response to Bill C-14. But things are operating at a level which, unfortunately, uh, make it seem that uh, you know, there's a whole other range of objectives here that, that are beyond one's grasp as a decent human being. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers formed somewhat reluctantly and with the idea that we have reached the point where litigation is sadly, you know, the first recourse instead of the last recourse for the reasons that you give. Nobody thinks litigation is a good way to go, right? Nobody. And, uh, you know, we, and frankly, it's not that I or anybody at Carl have excessive confidence in the courts either. But for the reasons that you give, um, that is, you know, this is the position we've been forced into. With Bill C-14, there might be the things that you can hang your hat on. And I hope that you find those things. <coughs> This um, young lady in the lovely yellow scarf. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know what Chloe for the question. And, um, so, first of all, I just want to like stand up and applaud, but just to play devil's advocate for the sake of it. I can see the federal government making an argument that if the provinces wanted to provide, and maybe they have made this argument, um, and so then this way they get to appeal to the constituents while at the same time leave someone else holding the bag. Right. How do you address that? Thank you, because you know I'm looking at the clock and I haven't talked about the provinces yet. So, so that's great, great the answer. So let me back up and give a couple of historical <coughs> explanations. So because this pro because you know, refugee healthcare is at the, you know, in the Venn diagram, the overlap of immigration and healthcare, you might have thought, why haven't the provinces been providing this all along? The the historical explanation for it is because it arose before the provinces got into healthcare. Now, had the federal government wanted to say, look, this is really a health care issue more than an immigration one. We think the provinces should be foot in the bill for health care. That would have been a federal provincial argument that presumably could have been dealt with through consultation negotiation between the feds and the provinces. Indeed, in the early 1990s, something like that did happen. Ontario provided more health care coverage to refugee claimants than it does now, and it said, feds, we want you to do this. And there was a wrangling, and the feds ended up taking on more. That could have been a productive in engagement with the issue if one's goal was to say somebody's got to provide health care to these folks and we think it should be you. If that's what's animating it, that's what would have happened, right? That wasn't the objective. The objective was not actually to ensure that these people were covered. So then, of course, what the, what the feds say is, oh, well, now Ontario's gone into it. Well, if you're suckers enough to do this, fine, but we're not paying for it. You think, well, so what happened to your argument about taxpayers then? So really you just care about which taxpayer pays for it, then not whether taxpayers pay for it at all. And of course the provinces stepping in is difficult for them. They've said, we're doing this on an interim basis. We're not conceding that it's our responsibility. We're going to do it. We're going to bill the feds for it. That, of course, I think is political rhetoric. Um, so I think um, the story of the provincial federal involvement is, is a little bit... Um, complicated by issues of jurisdiction and history. Um, but suffice to say that had the feds actually been concerned more about who pays rather than whether somebody pays, then this would have unfolded in quite a different way. So. Have any provinces like, spoken out and taken a position? Of course. I mean, Ontario, oh, many provinces have spoken out. Quebec was the first to step up. And Quebec partially fills the gap. 
Ontario most recently has stepped up to partially fill the gap. And what they have said is, you know, we are having to pay costs anyway, right? Because, as predicted, there are people coming to emergency wards, bad debt going into hospitals, and we're having to pay anyway. And besides, it's an intolerable situation. It is intolerable morally, it's intolerable as a matter of public policy, well, you know, and so on and so forth. So the feds can now say, great, you know, someone else can pay for it, you know, if you want to be a sucker, as it were. But it has happened in a way that is, you know, very um, problematic. And the coverage is not ideal, um, it's not complete, but there it is. Where's that? Uh, I'm wondering, and I'm really not sure whether the discussion is uh, related so much with your uh, uh, efforts to alleviate it, but how international convention on uh, uh, basic economic, social, and cultural rights would affect, would it be in contravention of the basic requirements? Uh, where all countries, and now Canada, that is the point of the international conventions. Directly, it has yeah. to go through yeah. the commission uh, to domestic legislation. But it's in, in contravention. Yeah. I mean, it's, so we've been, so part of the argument that we are making is that this violates various international legal obligations that Canada has, some of which have been incorporated into Canadian law. So we have, we're making arguments both about the Refugee Convention. So here, just to randomly list a few that we think Canada is violating. The Refugee Convention, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So we, we certainly are arguing it and as a way of both buttressing the, the claim that this violates the Charter and, both, and directly as part of um, Canada's international legal obligations. In addition, perhaps it's worth knowing that no other wealthy industrialized state does this, right? And indeed, under the European Union, what are called the asylum directives, okay, um, all states are required to furnish minimum essential emergency care to all asylum seekers and even those who, who are refused asylum. Yeah, so, yeah, questions. nobody else is as draconian as Canada in this way. Now, the United States is a somewhat different case because of their, they don't have the same sort of public health care system. But even under the US system, all I think it's all pregnant women and children get public health care under Medicaid or Medicare, including asylum seekers. Anyway, nobody does it like this. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've kind of usurped. <laughs> I'm just sorry about this. The, the, the two examples you gave were encouraging because the people did get the care they needed. Yeah. Are there some examples of people who were equally ill who were denied care? Because I think the important thing is that I think Canadians left, right, and center value that people get cared for when they need them. And um, whether which pocket pays for it seems less important than ensuring that people do get the care they need somehow. Or other. Well, there certainly are people going without care. Difficulty for us is that in trying to bring the case forward, we need to have affidavits, right? We need to, we proceeded by way of affidavit. And what, what do we get? We get doctors swear, you know, t swearing affidavits about the people who have come to them, some of whom have been turned away by other doctors. But we can only hear about the ones who have actually come to them because we could not get, apart from our litigants, those people who either never went for medical care because they didn't think they were covered rightly or wrongly, Okay, or those you know whose health conditions have deteriorated, and who knows what has happened to them. We couldn't access. We couldn't get those people to swear affidavits and put their names on them. But do we think it's happening? Do the doctors think it's happening? Yes, everybody thinks it's happening. Um, and so, how do you get those stories out? So the media would want us to produce people like that. It's just really hard to get people willing to talk about it, because they and I have to emphasize this: they legitimately fear reprisal. It's not in their imagination. Yeah. Um, just to respond to a couple of uh, points. There was a case, I believe, in Saskatchewan, where there was a woman, um, she was, I believe, from Latin America, was in Saskatchewan and um, was diagnosed with cancer and required um, chemotherapy treatment, and the federal government refused to provide it. 
and it hit the media, and Saskatchewan ended up covering it. So there are certainly cases that have made the news where individuals have been denied coverage by through IFHP, where provinces <coughs> um, stepped up. And to your question around, there are other yes, there are other provinces, Nova Scotia, and other provinces are in the process of developing interim programs similar to what Quebec and Ontario have. Um, we're not in a position to talk about it, though. Ontario has gone public because that's gone through cabinet. It's fully approved. It's now public. Nova Scotia, it's still in development. I guess if this came out of nowhere, with no consultation, there's going to be a lag time. Yeah. To where there's been a huge lag time yeah. for us to, to, you know, and if physicians who have already been doing billing are suddenly confused about it, you know, and it's a, it's a tremendous piece of work to put in place in terms of what are we going to cover, how are we going to cover, who gets what, ensuring that people get access to essential basic care. Um, and, and yeah, and then all of the administrative and all of the reporting, all of those mechanisms that support that. So that yeah. And I should uh, thank you for providing those examples. I should say, and I to expand on that, certainly people have been providing care on an ad hoc basis and provinces have been covering on an ad hoc basis. I think from the provincial perspective, if, correct me if I'm wrong, and certainly from any kind of, I don't know, healthcare perspective, it is far less than ideal to have care provided on an ad hoc basis, right? That's, you know, it just depends on the, the confluence of circumstances about who can get somebody's attention at the right time, right? That's not, it, that's no way to run a healthcare system, right? And this is a situation that provinces have been forced into because of the way in which the federal government has introduced their regime. There was a question back there, I thought, but I might have missed it. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, um, is treatment for STIs other than HIV? You know, I looked at the list of it the other day, and I don't remember. Um, let me just, as a little footnote, it's sort of interesting about HIV, because in immigration law, HIV um, has been resisted as a communicable disease or a public health risk for purposes of enabling people to visit and immigrate to Canada. So there's a funny thing going on here, because obviously anybody, you know, if it gets you health care, that's what matters. But curiously, you know, there's, there was real controversy over labeling HIV as a public health risk, because that was used to prevent people from entering Canada. So it's a curious thing about the status of HIV in particular under this regime. But I, yeah, I could direct you to where the list is, and you can look. Uh, yeah. I, who's there? Elaine. Oh. Okay. Oh, thanks so much. That was excellent. I, uh, you, you took us through two sections of the charter, section seven and fifteen, and talked about some of the challenges that uh, the case is encountering or is anticipating on those. You didn't talk about section one and about the principles of fundamental justice, um, and I wonder what. Uh, what sort of arguments the government has made and how effective they seem to be. If you look through their factum, it's interesting. You know, on Section 7, they do almost nothing under principles of fundamental justice, and they have very little under Section 1. Their strong argument, the overarching argument is this is a legitimate policy choice. Get out of our way. Um, and on the principles of fundamental justice, certainly we have argued that it is both arbitrary and disproportionate. Right? It's arbitrary to use one's immigrant, you know, to allocate health care on this basis as, you know, it is arbitrary in the sense that there is no, um, the claim, there's no what gets called instrumental rationality. You claim this is a cost saving measure. Here's the cost save, here are the cost implications. You claim this as deterring uh, non, you know, deterring <coughs> asylum seekers. There's no evidence that this is a draw, much less, you know, that denying it is a deterrent. You know, so we've gone after the sort of arbitrariness and the obvious disproportionality of its impact. On section one, the government, all it does is put forward, um, reiterate the arguments that I gave to you as the you know, fairness, uh, system integrity, and so on and so forth. But it's absolutely short on any kind of evidence. Uh, I'm going to try to pop in two questions. Could have been rapid fire, I suspect. Uh, Joanna has been waiting patiently, and then um, she was also. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess I'll build on the arbitrariness uh, uh, question um, because I think there is this um, presumptive 
rationality to the scheme uh, and in turn the persuasive rationality on the basis of its following categories which are already existing in refugee law, right? There's something about categories being inherent to that body of law that why, if they're legitimate there, are they not legitimate in one camp? And so I wondered if this challenge has something to um, move on the underlying logic of the system of uh, refugee claims, you know, and how arbitrary are those categories inside that scheme of sponsored, non-sponsored, so forth, and attacking some of the ra seemingly rationality of that scheme, because that is the presumptive rationality that's driving the healthcare policy. And I see the parallel being in the Aboriginal health context, right, where the government uses the Indian Act and the rationality of existing distinctions and categories in the Indian Act to then run right healthcare distributions. And so it seems like if you're going there's this presumption of non-arbitrariness, right, of rationality, because there's an underlying policy that, short of challenging that, will give you the foundation for uh, the legitimacy of this policy. Right. So I, I tried to sort of get to that in a not very coherent way by saying even if you thought that there was rationality to the refugee regime classification for purposes of refugee law, that does not demonstrate its rationality in its application in another domain, namely healthcare. So for example, you may legitimately distinguish between minimum and maximum security inmates for purposes of how you house them. But it's irrational to do that for purposes of healthcare allocation. But let me also say, apart from that, that uh, there is certainly there are, there's a constitutional challenge going on now to the safe country, the so-called designated country of origin, because that's the new, I uh, guess, um, category that's been introduced under the um, well, um, under the new law. So there are independently of the IFHP challenges going on to the rationality of that regime. Yeah. Like going the other way too, yeah. which would be great. Yeah. yeah, to demonstrate, yes, all of that. So this is all. I have to say that it is almost impossible to keep up with all of the litigation cha litigation issues that are presented by um, the changes to immigration law. Um, but certainly, we are challenging those as well. The last thing I'd say about that is, you know, one of the things that's very hard about using, in a, particularly Section 15, to challenge uh, what happens in immigration law is that the distinction between citizen and non-citizen is the ultimate inequality that is sanctioned by law. And you're always bumping up against that, right? Always. That, yeah, unequal and you ought to be, right? Um, and so it is particularly difficult to challenge. And when you see that inequality between citizen and non-citizen, then radiating metastasizing, if you will, metastasizing outwards to infect all other domains, to say that that inequality makes you unequal here too, and there too, and everywhere else. That's really what's going on and what we're trying to, to get at. So. She, oh, did she? Not? She was going to defer until later. <laughs> and I'm just going to thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, and just hold off that final round of applause. Uh, I just want to announce our next seminar is in just two weeks' time um, on January 24th. And we have the Honorable Anne McLennan, the former Federal Ministry of, Minister of Health. And her topic is um, the federal government, leader in health care. Question mark. So I hope I see many of you here with us again in two weeks. Thank you for your engaged um, questions and thank you for all of the